Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 828. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 27th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of our webcams and talk about the news, things that interest us, a little family life, sometimes the weather. Now, I'm going to talk about the weather because I'm stuck here in Connecticut for the next three days. It's going to get cold, really cold. But I'm heading back to, to Florida, George. I'll be joining you down there probably the, the first week sometime in November. Oh, how fun. The yeah. weather's lovely. Come on down. Yeah, packing up Sasquatch. We're in Connecticut now. Had uh, stopped for a day or two down in Virginia and kind of divide the trip up because it's it's 24 hours if you just drive straight. And I'm not so young no more. <laughs> can't can't get those road miles under me any, any more that long. Uh, when I was younger, you know, my 20s, 24 hours, no big deal. Come on. Road trip. So let's uh, be sure that you guys who are new to the program, subscribe to it. Um, you can do that by clicking on that little red rectangle and it pops a bell. If you click that bell, supposedly, some people have trouble with this, supposedly you'll be notified anytime there is a new Anglican Unscripted uploaded by me. I need you to also like this episode on Facebook or YouTube. If you see that thumbs up, please click it because that helps us um, become more popular than we already are, whatever that means. Also, comments. You need to go to the comment section and give us your opinion of stuff that we're right about, especially. Sometimes we're wrong about stuff. You can correct us. We're okay with that. But we want to know your opinion as well about the topics we talk about. And we appreciate you doing that in the comments section on YouTube. George, how are you doing this week? Busy week. We had our clergy conference uh, the beginning of this week. I just got out yesterday. And uh, I gave a presentation when, uh, one day about two-hour talk on exorcism. I shared uh, the information I learned on my trip to Rome, my studies, and I'm currently involved in a uh, ongoing case, and I shared that sort of as a case study with the other members of the clergy, mm -hmm. and uh, really was a powerful time together. That's great. One of the they, there are two schools of thought on exorcism in the sort of our Anglican world. One is that the exorcist has to have that spiritual gift or charism. Uh, people like Francis McNutt or Michael Green talk about that. And then there's the more sacramental uh, point of view where any priest who is trained and licensed by his bishop can do this. It's not uh, some, it, it's just a question of preparation and faith, not that you're called out specifically uh, to, with the ability to discern spirits and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I support the, the, the uh, anybody can be trained to do this if they are, you know, properly mature and faithful in their, uh, in their ministries. It brings up a funny story. I'm not going to name the name, but I have a previous priest who was doing his first one. And uh, um, about a week later, said, "Nope, not doing that again." And he would pa he would pass on any further cases up the, up the chain because uh, it wasn't his calling, and he he knew it was real, and um, just you know. So it's an interesting uh, uh, thought process. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. <laughs> I I I asked the uh, the woman how she came to call me. She said, well, I called the Catholic Church, and they told me to call you. <laughs> and uh, she also happens to be Mormon, so I think I know why they had the Catholics call sure, Pepper they, call me. They don't want to deal with that. All right, you sent me a PDF with some show notes here. Let's bring these up. And the Global South Fellowship, GSFA, uh, Global South, Jesus, uh, I can't even talk. Uh, Global South of Fellowship in Anglicans has met in Cairo, and uh, they came up with some uh, points they wanted us to know. They put that out in a communique. They talked about the uh, hospital, the Anglican hospital that was bombed in Gaza. Uh, and let's talk about some of the other things they, they, they divulged in the communique, George. Yes, there were 12 archbishops there, uh, some from the GSFA, some from GAFCON, and some like Albert Chama of Central Africa who are not affiliated with either group. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very strong gathering. Uh, 
mostly Africans, of course, but that is the way with the Anglican world today. Plus, there were observers and visitors, somebody from Sydney, uh, John Dunnett of the Church of England Evangelical Council, and Nikki Gumbel of Alpha Fame were present. What? Nikki was there? Yeah, somebody uh. from Sydney. Uh, Fraser Lawton, who was uh, and a bishop in the Episcopal Church who moved, I think, pretty sure he's one of those guys who was a bishop up in Canada and now is an assistant bishop in Dallas, mm -hmm. but st still acting as a bishop. And the main work was, of course, giving an update on where they were and where things were going. And they reaffirmed their Kigali, the, the Kigali statement uh, made by GAFCON. They refer, reaffirmed their Jerusalem declaration, which was the end the, of GAFCON, and their Cairo covenant. So they're basically all Gaf, GAFCON and Global South are on the same page on all issues. Global South is the one now that is going to carry the battle forward politically. Um, the And that battle is reordering the higher instruments of the Anglican Communion, where the Archbishop of Canterbury is no longer the de facto leader of the Anglican world. Part of their statements were pretty strong. They said they were basically appalled that the bishops of the Church of England are pushing for change on same-sex blessing, same-sex marriage. The bishops should be the, the, the guardians of the faith, not uh, experimenters with the faith. They talked a great length about Christian persecution in Pakistan and in Africa and in other parts of the world. And they said that we're deeply concerned that if the Church of England presses ahead with the proposed changes, this will increase persecution, persecution of Christians in many parts of the global south. Now, this is not new because Justin Welby himself said this at the last synod meeting, but then went ahead and pushed it forward. Now, some of the interesting news that's not really been picked up, and in Anglican Inc. we'll go into a bit more detail, is Nikki Gumbel's presentation to the archbishops. Nikki Gumbel, of course, is the man intimately associated with the Alpha Movement, probably the most famous English clergyman of the current generation. Sure. He's stepped down as rector of Holy Trinity Brompton, or, or vicar, I don't know his exact title, but he's still very active in the uh, uh, Alpha Movement. Nicky Gumbel was part of the group of English uh, conservatives who wrote to the House of Bishops saying, you can't go forward with this because of reasons of doctrine and discipline and church tradition and teaching and contrary to the Bible, you know, why it's wrong. And Nikki came to the Global South meeting to enlist their support. He said, Nikki Gumbel said, he is going to be filing a lawsuit against the Church of England's House of Bishops to block all of the changes that they're proposing on the grounds <coughs> that this change in worship is a change of doctrine, that this is a fiction that pastoral practice can be separated from doctrine, doctrine and teaching. If the Church of England is going to change its doctrine, it has to do it through certain routes. It cannot just, by the bishop's fiat, introduce these prayers. And Gumbel says he's quite confident, because they've retained legal counsel and they're ready to run with this, that they will prevail. So he, Gumbel is saying that nothing is going to happen in November because they're going to block it. But he wants the Global South bishops to sort of stand behind him as he takes the fight to the courts. So this is a plan C or D? I mean, pl plan A is to reform uh, the Church of England, to cause it to uh, find its the error of its ways, repent, and return to the fold. Plan 2 or plan B is to set up a alternative structure there where uh, bishops, priests, and uh, lay people can flee and have a safe resource in a different church. Mm -hmm. Plan C is now to sue? I, yes. I'm, I, okay. Now, this is a bit of a surprise because Nikki Gumbel is an insider's insider's and establishment's establishmentarian. Sure. Yeah. Well, who's, who's evangelical? He is breaking ranks with the, the team. Mm -hmm. And he believes so firmly in this. And I congratulate him on this. There are some Alpha Churches, Holy Trinity Brompton plants that are fully in, tied into the gay agenda. I think St. Mary's is one of the names, but nonetheless, you can find them on the internet who are 
thing. Well, we're not blessing gay blessings yet, but as soon as it's loud, we will do it. These are plans from Holy Trinity Brompton. And over the years, if you know, when I first went through Alpha 25 years ago, they were quite clear on the human sexuality issue. Over the, over the decades, they've softened the approach. And as Nicky Gumbel told the bishop, archbishops, he didn't really fight this fight. This wasn't his battle. Right. But now he believes that if this goes forward, it will kill the Church of England. The Church of England will be over. And so he is entering the ring uh, to take the battle uh, to defeat this. Now, he was asked, well, what happens if you lose, lose and the lawsuits are unsuccessful? And his response was, we won't lose. And then he says, well, would you could ever join the Anglican Convocation in Europe? Any of the things that GAFCON and the Global South have been backing in England? No, that's not our way forward. So there's no plan B for Nicky Gumbel. They're putting all their energy into the legal strategy. And the second thing is they're not looking to join the Global South group. They're looking for the Global South group to join them. And that may be a uh, nicety that many people may not particularly appreciate, but one or two primates, uh, no, I'll be fair, one primate commented that uh, it's a bit rich for the English to asking us to join their team again to fight the good fight. Uh, instead of joining our team to fight the good fight. In other words, there's a, one of the problems they've had in England is that uh, they just all can't get together. The conservatives cannot join one team under one leader. There's no Bob Duncan. Yes, and the no, Gumbel approach, though yeah. I, I cannot judge the, the legal merits of it. It may be a fantastic case, and they certainly have the money to employ the best legal counsel that England can provide. Mm-hmm but they're quite clear that they're not going to go under the authority of the foreigners or join somebody else's team. They're going to be on their team. But my problem here is you're taking a church that for the last decade has been pathetic. The Church of England has largely been a pathetic organization. Um, now, the last 18 months, it's an enemy of the gospel. The church is an enemy of Christ. And you just want to take it from being an enemy back to pathetic. I I don't see a solution there. I think that the, the global south has a better solution um, in this than just fighting them in court to stop one doctrine change. They'll find a way to do it. Uh, you're just you're putting up a, a small roadblock for uh, a church that has uh, uh, become evil, you know, for all intents and purposes, George. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and one other thing, maybe just because of my American point of view, when we did go into litigation in the United States, con- the only people who would follow the litigation would be the conservatives if they won or if they lost. The liberals didn't matter. That was just another tool in their arsenal, and they would not stop uh, whether they won or they lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, while the conservatives, well, the courts have decided that we have to live with it. That is not true on the left, and I assume that will probably be the mindset of many in the Church of England. Now, meanwhile, uh, independently of the GAFCON, the, the Global South meeting, the English left is furious with the bishops uh, because it looks like it's going to be till 2025 till they'll get gay blessings. So it's nobody's happy uh, in this. Uh, in this ha- ha- having sold its soul. I think the Church of England deserves to to enter the SSM uh, fray. You know, they you, you, they can't get any more pathetic. Just do it. You know, and, and I, I'll be honest, there are some churches that are doing it. They're just, they're just not uh, being uh, public about it. Now, I also saw in the communique that they condemned the bombing of the uh, hospital in Gaza, the Anglican hospital. <laughs> Yeah, and the we Anglican... should talk a little bit about that because I, I did an interview uh, last week with David uh, uh, Pelleggi, and uh, he says uh, it may not be accurate. Yeah, that the, the uh, Anglicans have taken a different tack than the other churches in that region. Now, the bishops, the archbishops, are meeting 100, 200 miles from uh, the yeah. site of the. They're in Egypt, and uh, Egypt has moved 100,000 troops up to the border of Gaza 
because they don't want the Gazans in their country because they'll just cause them grief, which is a whole different issue. But uh, when the uh, Al Hali, the Arab hospital, was hit by uh, something, uh, the churches led by the patriarchs condemned Israel. The Anglicans sort of held back and then Justin Welby visited and said, well, let's investigate and see what's going on. And now at this stage, there's no, the, the there's incontroversial, incontroversial evidence that this was a Hamas rocket that fell short, landed in the parking lot. And in the West, we were treated to an absolute uh, failure of the media from the BBC to the American networks and CNN saying 500 dead directly targeted and nobody did any reporting. They just repeated a Hamas press release. Well, the net result then has been riots and marches all around the world um, sit in at the Capitol Dome in the United States. Um, well, Welby made a remarkable statement to the Times of Israel. And he said that uh, immediately blaming Israel for the death of Christians is just a modern version of the blood libel. And that is that the Jews are seeking the blood of Christians. Uh, there was something called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in the 19th century, where this crazy, crazy conspiracy theory said that Jews kill Christian babies to mix their blood into matzah for Passover, all this and that, all total nonsense. But it was used by the Russian government to encourage pogroms against Jews and the Nazis picked it up and it's very popular in the Muslim world. And so just to say that Israel deliberately targeted a hospital to kill people uh, is a blood libel. And immediately, well, we got a strange new respect from people uh, that normally don't care what he has to say. From Alan Dershowitz, the Harvard, famous Harvard lawyer, to the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, uh, all were saying, yes, it's great to have uh, a, a man of integrity like Justin Welby to say the truth and the obvious. And the next day, Welby then walked back his statement saying, well, gosh, maybe I shouldn't have used the phrase blood libel because, you know, the Palestinian are genuinely outraged and we need to take in their accounts too. So somebody got to Justin while he was still in Israel to get him to walk back his good statement to make a nice mushy statement where... Uh, well, he, and, but that's where we live here. Okay, what, I, people probably don't know this. What's the gray lady, George? It's the New York Times. New York Times. New York Times front page day, the day after the supposed hospital bombing says Israel bombs Gaza hospital 500 dead um, and does a, a, a four, I guess, in total, three page story on it. And they have spent, if you go to Anglican Inc., you're not going to really find an error page or a correction page because we don't make a lot of errors. If we do, it's a whole story about the error. They have a little small section on page three where they, they put uh, oh, corrections for a newspaper. Every day since then, they've slowly corrected the story. Well, we may have misinterpreted the original videotape that was given to us. Um, they never once say, hey, our story was written by Hamas. <laughs> you know, they don't admit the truth to it. And so they spent the last 10 days slowly walking back the story, but they never admitted that it wasn't a bomb from Israel or a missile from Israel. They never admitted that the hospital itself was never uh, struck. Uh, they never admit that it's a parking lot behind the hospital. Um, nobody wants to tell the truth in this. And that's very disappointing. Uh, I used to be a fan of the American press. I used to read, two decades ago, the New York Times. I appreciated a liberal perspective. But now they're, it's just so biased. It's so uh, anti-Semitic, I hate to say it. It's almost as anti-Semitic as the BBC, and that's a hard standard to follow, George. Oh, my. And Well, this, this sort of leads us into our, our next thing about where things stand now with the church leaders. They're calling for an immediate ceasefire. They're calling for a proportionate response to Israel. Mm -hmm. But they're not telling the Israelis what they would consider a proportionate response. Well, first the of all, church leaders are throwing out slogans 
not answers. Right. What it Israel does not need to be told how to fight a war. Okay, Israel does not need to be told how to to invade somebody. For the love of God, they are texting people before they uh, take out a Hamas building. Please leave the area. Did Hamas do that uh, when they invaded the villages on the on the border? Did they do that before they hit that uh, rock concert dance-a-thon thing? No. They just went in there with the guns. And uh, having seen now some of that video, uh, I am a very upset individual as a reporter uh, because nobody's telling the truth. Uh, it's... Uh... But, you know, if the church is going to exercise moral authority, it needs to do so with clarity. Mm -hmm. And just to throw out slogans that are ultimately seem to be generated by the Hamas and the, the left-wing media uh, machine, um, just, they don't, it, it robs it of, and, you know, when Melby, when Welby made his blood libel statement, it was one of those odd intersections of truth and power and moral integrity. And the Archbishop met that. And wisdom. And then he's been running away ever since. I mean, Justin Welby showed himself that he could, showed us he could be a leader in this. And he could think clearly and speak yeah. clearly. I mean, and this, is, this is the same guy who went into uh, nations at war around Africa and was there to present what peace looked like. This is years ago decades ago now but he in his heart he knows mm -hmm. so let's hope he can step mm -hmm. up again what do we got here for our next story george elizabeth uh von spruce sort of follows oh yeah in this she, <laughs> sure uh, i i pulled up the video here um and I, uh, this is something new. I don't know if it's going to come through, but this is uh, Israel um, von Spruce. This I'm is the uh, police officer okay. who uh, is going to give her a ticket because she was silently praying in the vicinity of an abortion clinic. I know there's a zone here, and but I'm not protesting within the zone. The rot I'm of the conversation you're seeing is, is horrid. Um, I'll provide a link below so you can actually watch it, but no, um, it's a shame that we, we've come to 1984, George, so quickly. And what's doubly offensive is here is she's getting a ticket to appear in court. She's being cited for uh, uh, disturbing the peace. When you go to London and when you have Hamas sympathizers, Palestinian sympathizers, shouting, kill the Jews from the river to the sea, uh, Palestine will be free, meaning we want to uh, empty the land of all Jews, defacing Nelson's column and the cenotaph. Mm -hmm. And none of these people seem to be arrested. None of these people seem to be brought up on charges of uh, disturbing the peace, where here Elizabeth von Spruce is praying silently in her head and is arrested by two police officers. Well... England is going through a terrible time with crime, and uh, it's just out of control compared to you know the past. And now uh, they have the resources to police speech, but not to address terrorism and terroristic threats. My disappointment here is not that uh, uh, Van Spruce was arrested. My disappointment is that tens of thousands of people every day are not arrested mm -hmm. for showing up to these uh, uh, areas that are blocked off from praying and pray and they should be there praying silently, showing that, that this this is a step too far. How dare you stop us from uh, you know praying in our heads? That's ridiculous. Well, what. <laughs> We have to say, in this case, some of the things that have happened in New York City over the past few days are much, I would say, even worse. Oh, Cooper Union is a uh, is a small college in New York City. Uh, it's famous because there's no tuition for it. It was endowed mm -hmm. all those century, all those years ago, and a pro-Palestinian march went past the library, and they saw identify so, uh, Jewish students were seen through the windows of the library. They, you know, always wearing. Uh, kippahs or yarmulkes and whatnot, and they proceeded to mob the library. And 
The police did not intervene. The campus security didn't intervene. It was the librarians who locked the doors and told the Jewish students to go hide in the attic. Now, Jews hiding in the attic just takes me back to Anne Frank. Uh, but these kids, these, these Palestinian protesters, were not arrested. And they're chanting death to these Jews. My goodness, this is New York City. Mm -hmm. um, there was an... Oh, where... You know, well, my I'm just appalled. Anti-Semitism is the canary in the coal mine. They're going to come for the Jews first, then they're going to come eventually, Kevin, for you and me and anybody who doesn't think according to the way the new fascists want us to think. If we have a different opinion, there's no live and let live. There's no libertarian sense of you go, you're an adult, you're, so long as you don't hurt somebody by your viewpoints, you're free to be as crazy as you want. That's gone. It's if you don't think the way I do, you must be destroyed. And, you know, we're seeing this picked up. Uh, well, I don't want to sound like a, a conspiracy theorist, but my goodness, this is not the country that I recognize. Well, uh, here, here, I will post a quick video up here of a lady who was talking to the school board about books she found in the library for kindergarten and middle school kids, elementary school kids. And uh, she's just Paige. Hey, uh, start. I'm okay, sorry. this is we, in Children's quickly, Libraries here, here in Hillsborough County, Whatever. approved by she that committee unanimously at Plant Heights in multiple schools. Quickly took the There's down 10 images of that woman's naked breast in that book. Thank you. Uh, to be Thank you, next speaker. Uh, at a school board meeting. Um, look but at it's this not image. To be shown this was to in our children. the and book and just, they all unanimously said and, that this you know, it, and along with that 15 page i'm watching a police officer take away okay this uh, is in children's libraries in here library, in hillsborough county but we're not allowed to tell people about it <sighs> that, and you have to ask if that policeman is ashamed he's ashamed well, if because he has kids yeah. if he has kids you know he's only following orders well that didn't work for the nazi guards uh the, the, you know, and at a certain point, they're going to have to say, uh, "I cannot enforce. I cannot enforce illegal laws. I cannot enforce evil." Mm -hmm. uh, we're each going to have to come to that decision point at some time or another. We will not cooperate. Um, we will not uh, conform. And if we don't stand up for the Jews in our midst right now, then we are, well, we're bad Christians, number one, but we're bad citizens. Bad Americans. Yeah. All right, let's pull up the stories here. Uh, next one, we did all that. We did go. We did hospital. Uh, response, but church. Oh, let's do the church times story. Church times put out a story. I I read it this morning, talking about how the bishops voted on LLF and the coming trouble that the uh, the Church of England is going to have here. Yeah, the Church Times, uh, the House of Bishops, uh, it's it's really annoys me greatly because conservative bishops do not leak. They do not tell the press what's happening in these closed-door meetings where they're sworn to silence. Liberal bishops have no compunction in leaking if it serves their purposes. And so the liberal bishops are leaking because what they wanted the Church Times to know was that the votes amongst the, all the bishops not just those who sit in general synod, but all the bishops, almost 90 plus, was overwhelmingly in favor of starting with same-sex blessings immediately. Welby and Cottrell walked it back in the final statements to this process uh, statement that we have right now that were the two tracks. One is you know synod-based and the other is um, uh, liturgical-based and whatnot. And this statement, the the arguments and everything were sort of put out to the Church Times by disaffected liberal bishops who were trying to muscle on Justin Welby. Um, so what can we say about this? Well, the, by and large, the House of Bishops of the Church of England seems lost. Uh, the And then uh, the other thing I would say is the courage of the 
11 bishops who have publicly said no uh, to what is going on uh, must be applauded because the conformist culture in the Church of England's House of Bishops is very intense. Yeah. But, uh, but we cannot look to the House of Bishops to help or save or fix anything here. They're just following the dictates of the boss. All right, more stories here. Oh, you sent me a story that says the bishop by Iceland must go. That's going to be interesting. Yes, one of the Anglican Inc. specials, stories that you never knew, and after you read it, you don't care. Well, the Church of Iceland is the state church of Iceland. It's a Lutheran church with an episcopacy, and their bishops serve fixed terms of office. And the Synod recently changed the terms of office, and the sitting Bishop of Iceland said, well, I guess I'm not grandfathered in. I can use the old term, which takes me to six years instead of the current law, which takes me to five years and whatnot. And we need to, long and the short of it is, she stayed past her uh, sell-by date. And a court, and the courts, the Supreme Court of Iceland ruled that everything she's done for the last two years is void because she did not have Episcopal authority. So all the ordinations, all the all of the official church acts that she did, she did not do with the authority of a bishop. She did with the authority of a uh, bishop. Inspired bishop. Be doing that. Yeah. Inspired bishop. <laughs> so the Church of Iceland is basically in panic mode because all of a sudden the people in Iceland are thinking, well, who cares? <laughs> a crisis. It's, it's, as if, it's as if you now have an anti-pope, and all of a sudden the people say, yeah, who cares? <laughs> so it, it, it's just fun uh, that just to think it's not just us who has these uh, lawsuits and uh, silly issues. Uh, Iceland is in turmoil over its episcopacy, and it's cod quota too, but uh, I think more people are interested in how many fish they can sell to England than they are to uh, the status of their bishop. All right, well, let's bring it back to, to the Episcopal Church. We have a story from Wisconsin and Florida. Let's start with Wisconsin. The diocese, which are three, or were three, in Wisconsin, are now going to merge into one, and it's going to be, I hopefully, called the Diocese of Wisconsin, headed by a current bishop, George. Looks uh, Fond du Lac, Eau Claire, and uh, Milwaukee, uh, their synods have all met, and they need to do one more to formally vote it all in, but everybody's agreeable to merging. There was once a diocese of Wisconsin, and the early 20th century was split into three, the South, the Northeast, and the Northwest. And the South comprises basically is Madison South to Milwaukee, and that's probably 80% of the people of Wisconsin. The rest are cows and woods and deer hunters. Uh, cheese makers. <laughs> cheese makers. Uh, you know, like the North, you know, unless you want to go to, how many people are in Green Bay, Kevin? I mean, not, at the end of the day, not that many. No, and actually, Green Bay, Green, uh, the biggest cities are going to be uh, Madison, obviously, the capital, Milwaukee in that area. You go further up to the Fond du Lac, Green Bay area. Um, smaller cities are La Crosse and Eau Claire. So, yeah. You know, like the cities or cities are like ten to twenty thousand people cities, not million people city. So the writing's been on the wall for a long time, and the reality is that the uh, they've had a uh, a part time bishop in one diocese. The diocese in Milwaukee has an interim bishop, former bishop of Chicago, is uh, stepping in, and Matt Gunter is the, currently the only elected bishop in the three dioceses. And probably what will happen, you know, it'll all get fixed out at the end, that Matt Gunter will be the bishop of the merged three dioceses. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a question of demographics. Part of it is uh, that northern Wisconsin is not growing in population. Um, Madison is growing. Uh, Milwaukee suburbs are growing. There are parts of Wisconsin that are doing just great. But the small mill towns, river mill towns, and the farming communities, people live in the farm. Uh, they're not just empty Episcopal churches. They're empty Lutheran churches and Methodist churches dotted across the countryside in northern and western Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. So it's, it's demographics. 
It's demographics, but there's also a large evangelical, non-denominational uh, presence in Madison and Milwaukee and the Fond du Lac area that uh, the Episcopal Church will never get back. You know, mm-hmm. They've given up that ground. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a sign of uh, losing demographics, George. And it's not just Wisconsin where we're seeing this. So we mentioned, I think, in our last show that in Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania and Bethlehem, which were created in the 20s when the world was young and new, uh, are going to talk talking about merging. Northwestern Pennsylvania, which is Erie, and Western New York, which is Buffalo, are talking about merging. Um, and then we're going to probably see things happen in Missouri, Eastern and Western Missouri, Kansas, Eastern and Western Kansas, um, places like that. And we may see, you know, the Dakotas merge uh, because it's not economically viable to maintain the uh, the infrastructure of Episcop- multiple episcopacies when your uh, congregations are so full declining so quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, we probably won't see this happen in Springfield for ideological reasons. Springfield is conservative. Chicago is liberal. So we probably won't see either group wanted to do that. Uh, Or certainly Springfield wouldn't wish to be submerged into the uh, diocese of Chicago. But it's just the way forward in the future in certain parts of the country. In Florida, um, some of the diocese can already now be divided again and will prosper. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Diocese of Florida. Um, they had the, the Charlie Holt issue. They uh, mm-hmm. re-elected him two or three times? Three times? Twice. Uh, twice. Elected him twice. Twice. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, he was finally just not able to get the uh, votes needed by the standing committees around the country to be the uh, new bishop of, of the Diocese of Florida. We are now to the point where Florida is like, well, what can we do about this? There's got to be a solution. Now they're trying to look at the numbers of people who can vote, especially the clergy. Charlie Holt is now rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Jacksonville. So he's landed on his feet. Good good for Charlie. But the uh, standing committee has put forward some canonical uh, changes to the diocesan constitution and canons to be voted at their next convention. And one of them is, is to find who may be a voter. Currently, anybody, any clergy in the Diocese of Florida is eligible to vote for elections. And what that, and that caused the first issue, which was a quorum. Did we have enough retirees who don't live in Florida, but retired from the Episcopal Church 10, 20 years ago, but live in South Carolina or someplace, who don't come to convention? Um, That lowers the, uh, that raises the quorum level. Second, we have people who, some who've retired and joined the diocese who've never, don't have office, but like to be, I think, politically active, but have no pastoral responsibilities or uh, there's no, you know, they do not represent the, you know, the diocese. And so the diocese is saying, we're going to change the rules so that only clergy with cures, either retirees with part-time jobs or uh, ministries and those in active ministry will be eligible to vote and that will trim 88 clergy from the voting ranks. Now the liberals are crying foul because their strength has come from getting uh, these dead uh, uh, rotten boroughs to, to talk about English parliamentary history right, where, yes. <laughs> where one borough in parliament represents 12 people in a medieval village that sank a thousand years ago into the mud. Um, they don't like this because that will water down their voting influence. But the standing committee wants basically to make things cleaner, crisper, and have a clear understanding of who and what the Diocese of Florida is based on its congregations and active clergy, not based on uh, political interest groups. All right, well, let's uh, finish up here. We have a story from Uganda that's interesting. Um, uh, Uganda Electoral Disputes. Charges, uh, charges Chancellor fixed candidate list in Namorambi. I can't pronounce that, George. It's because I was brought up in the Midwest and I don't uh, do very well with uh, uh, names that aren't Johnson or Anderson. Help me out here. Well, Church of Uganda has two Episcopal election uh, 
issues. Mm -hmm. There was one diocese where a bishop was elected and the losing side after the election filed a complaint accusing him of adultery. And this case, and this was brought to the House of Bishops' attention, who then voided the election, saying we can't have a man, you know, with adultery and everything. And and an investigation was then held to see if this man is an adultery, he shouldn't even be in the church. It's found he was innocent. And he went to Archbishop Kazimba and said, uh, can you reinstate me as bishop? And Kazimba said, no, we can't. I mean, it's got to do everything over again. Well, he didn't like that. Uh, Canon Kasana was his name. And he filed suit against the Church of Uganda to force them to reinstate him as bishop. And this past week, the courts in Uganda said, no, we're not getting involved in an eternal church dispute. The church has the right to determine who its leaders are. And even if its processes are not perfect, it still must be allowed to make its own decisions. The second issue is the Diocese of Nemerimbe, which is near around Kampala. It's a big deal. And uh, with the cathedral and the church headquarters are located in Nemerimbe. The uh, chancellor of the diocese was acute. Uh, they had an election, but then it was stopped before the election was held. And the House of Bishops investigated claims the chancellor basically fixed the candidate list. There were nominees and nominations, but the chancellor sort of crossed off people and took it down to one candidate who was his friend and a no-hoper, somebody who was not really going to win. In essence, the allegation is to get his buddy elected. Well, before they got that far, it, uh, it blew up and the House of Bishops were investigating. The Church of Uganda has put out statements saying, no, 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 we're investigating this, just normal checks and balances. But uh, the human element is at work in Uganda, as it is in the United States and elsewhere, where sometimes bad people in good organizations do bad things. It happens. I mean, so I here we have one poor, fella, <laughs> one poor fellow whose rival sabotaged his election, and we have another case where uh, somebody tried to fix an election through uh, stacking the candidates list. You would think they would have a full investigation before they fired him as a bishop. In my opinion, that's what we do here in the ACNA. In ACNA, your trial, which may take a year, uh, is there to be sure they have all the answers and uh, that nobody, uh, that they do it in transparency. Um, but uh, not so yet in Uganda. We'll, we'll see. Um, one of the problems that I have with the Anglican Church is it often follows culture um, in many cases around the world. In fact, I can't think of maybe six or seven countries which have voted to have same-sex marriage in their countries where the church has not followed, including the Anglican Church. Uh, here, a great example, the Episcopal Church certainly led, did not follow uh, the American society into same-sex marriage, uh, uh, Britain, clearly. Uh, and we, we read a story, not about an Anglican Church, uh, but uh, the Estonia Lutheran Church says its clergy may not bless same-sex marriage even though the country has passed laws saying it can happen here. Cool. After Estonia received its independence from the Soviet Union, uh, the churches were sort of freed up and the Estonian Lutheran Church became the de facto state church. Uh, salaries are not paid by the government, but basically it became the church for the Estonian people. There's the Orthodox Church as well, and the Catholic Church, but the Estonian Lutheran Church is the church. And it, it was given the authority to basically be agents of the government to solemnize marriages and this and that. And Estonia became the first of the Baltic nations to allow same-sex marriage. And the government said, now Estonian Lutheran Church, you now have to bless same-sex marriages. And the Estonian Lutherans said, no, we're not going to do it. And if you make us do it, we won't, we will give up our rights to be agents to solemnize marriage. Cool. And if you want to do that, everybody has to get married at the justice of the peace, and then they can come to the church if they want. But we will not do same-sex marriages in Estonia, in the Lutheran church. So here's, now, religion is at a pretty low ebb in the Baltic, as it is in most of the former Soviet Union. It's coming back slowly but surely. But here's a church that took a brave step and fought the culture, fought the government, fought the people who basically can make their lives easier by standing on principle. 
And it's interesting because the next door, the Latvians, where Archbishop Foley Beach went to uh, commemorate, I think the anniversary, I don't know how many years of their archbishop. Yeah. The Latvians were the ch Lutheran church that had women clergy and then said, no, it was a mistake and walked it back. So the little Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Lithuania not yet, but Latvia and Estonia have really led out of, uh, out of principle on some of the issues that the bigger churches haven't uh, wanted to touch or have given up and gone over with to the status quo of this culture. Yeah. Well, <laughs> now that they do what culture does, they think they can do it better. Pretty sad. All right, that's enough for this edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 828 of Anglican Unscripted.